that we get asked a lot or there's I suppose some not not a lot of clarity around is the steps in conducting an audit. It's not clear where you are in the audit process, the steps. So we've added this seven, these seven steps in so that it's clear what stage you are at within the audit because you know, we, we might just talk about document review and it's sort of a big, well, okay, well, where does document review fit in to everything? Why am I doing this now? How does it feed into the next step? And so on. So as a whole, these are the seven steps. Okay, initiate the audit, do your document review, pre prepare for your on-site activities, conduct those on-site activities, then you can prepare the audit report, complete the audit, and then conduct the follow-up. All right, I'm going to step it out step by step. All right, so obviously the first step is initiating the audit. All right, so I'm just going to scroll down because Kelly Taylor has laid it out neatly in this one. So this initiating the audit includes appointing the audit team leader. We should have something about the team. Yeah, so obviously we need to understand who our audit team is as well. And then part of that is, well, who's going to be the audit team leader? We need to understand and define why we're conducting the audit, what the scope of the audit is. So the scope is the extent and boundary. So which locations are they any particular, is it any particular like um, departments, activities, processes? Mm. And then the criteria, what are we conducting the audit against? You can see we actually can't commence the audit at this stage unless we know who, our, who is on our audit team, who the team leader is, what we're auditing against what the scope is and why we're conducting it. It also talks about determining the feasibility of the audit. So do we have enough information to understand what the objective scope and criteria are or appoint a, um, an audit team? Um, is the auditee on board? It, you know, does the time frame suit, et cetera? Um, and do, do we have an audit team that's available? What's the duration of the audit? So this is all about understanding, well, what do we need to move forward with this audit? And then, of course, the final thing is once we know all of this, your audit team, audit team leader, objective, scope, criteria, and have we got all of the information we need, then we can establish that um, initial contact with the auditee to say, hey, this is what we've planned. And then that starts that process off with, um, and this will come up later in preparation with your audit plan and timetable and so on. All right. So that is step one. Sorry for all the scrolling, but that is step one. Just understanding what it is about this audit, what, what do we need, who our audit team is, and so on. All right, just those basics. Once we know that, we can move to the second one, which is conducting document review. So I'm going to skip to that one here. This is a bit of a different layout, so I'm just going to stay here and talk about it. So now that we know this audit is coming up, we know who our audit team is, we know the objective, scope, and criteria, we would have, we would have or could request a certain amount of documentation to review. Now, document review can be called different things. It can be called a gap analysis. It can be called a stage one audit, okay? So a document review is normally just reviewing an organization's system 
against the criteria to see whether what they say they do meets the criteria. It's as simple as that. We're not necessarily getting into the nitty gritty of the um, operation side and getting them to show us yet. We're just looking at a document level, okay? Hence why it's called a document review. Um, so as part of say a certification audit, um, an initial certification, the document review is very separate to the actual audit. So we will actually conduct a document review separately to review the, the organisation's system against the criteria to determine whether they're ready to move forward with the certification audit or stage two it's called as well. Now, as auditors, we're, all, we're constantly conducting document review, aren't we? That's really just what an audit is. <laughs> like we talk about this document review at this stage as a bit more of a formal, okay, we, we understand what you say you do and an output from a document review um, might be your checklist of questions, what you're going to follow up because you're going to identify areas that are potential gaps. And it's, it's like doing your homework beforehand. You're getting an understanding of what they say they do, where you think you might need a little bit more information, and that's, that becomes your question. So that's what I mean with a document review. We're constantly doing it. So if I'm conducting a, a recertification audit or a surveillance audit even, um, I'm always going to read what they say they do first and ask my questions as a result of that, okay? Or I suppose you could get them to show you what they do and then you can check that against the documentation. Okay, so I'm coming from the opposite end. No matter which way you're coming from, you're still reviewing the documentation. Okay, whether you're reviewing it against the criteria or you're reviewing what they've demonstrated to you and you're reviewing that against what they are meant to do. All right, so this document review can be, it is, ongoing, but in a more formal setting, you, you would normally do a document review like as a stage one audit or a gap audit, something like that. Okay, once you've done your document review, you normally know a lot more about what the business does and how they do it. Okay, so as I said, then you, you sort of know which direction you're heading. Now, because of that, we can move on to step three, which is preparing for our on-site activities. So. I'll just go there. Ta-da! Number three is there. So now we can see where we're in the scheme of things. Okay, we're preparing for our on-site activities. So on-site activities include things like your opening meeting, conduct your audit interview, team meeting, closing meeting. All right. But we've got some preparation to do first. Right. Now that we know a little bit more about what we're doing because of these first two steps. All right, so I'll just saw, um, saw this here. All of these tasks are the responsibility of the team leader. Okay, that's a good point to take away from this. Um, and if you're an independent, ind like working on your own, you're, you're the team leader. The audit plan. Okay, now that you know more about what the organisation says they do, what you think are potential gaps, you can start putting the audit plan and this should, I don't know if you've included the timetable. Oh, this is the timetable assigning work to the audit team. Okay, so with, with regards to your preparation, your audit plan is about what do I need to be able, so there are no roadblocks when I turn up on site, okay? So it could be things like 
um, PPE induction requirements, um, religious, cultural um, requirements, language, you know, dress, all, all, all of these things that we need to understand so that when we turn up, nothing's going to stop us from continuing, okay? So that's why we do the audit plan. And what accompanies the audit plan, I'm just going to skip that one for now, is a timetable. So this assigning work to the audit team, you'll normally see in the form of a timetable. Now, I just thought of this as I said timetable because it can be quite formal um, and I'm used to timetables for certification audits. But something important to note here is if you're conducting, say, internal audits within your own business, your internal audits, you know, whether you're an, the internal auditor there as an employee or you might be a consultant, if your internal audits are only like the scope is quite small, um, it's a certain department or certain activities and processes, an internal audit might only be a few hours or half a day. You might not do a formal timetable for that, but what you will do is you know, send an email and say, hey, I'm due to conduct this audit on this date. I'll be there at 8.30. We'll have a quick opening meeting where I'll you know, explain what the, the four hours will cover. We should finish by about lunchtime. Is there anything I need to be aware of? Do I need PPE and so on? Feel free to ask any questions beforehand. That's a timetable and an audit plan, isn't it? Okay, so while we do sort of formalise it in our training, we do have to remember that it can be in any form. So, yeah, please, please remember that. So that covers your timetable and your audit plan. Audit team communication, yeah. So it says we need to establish how the audit team will communicate with each other. Again, this comes from the team leader. I know as a team leader, um, when I'm as a part of an audit team, I'll have a conversation with my audit teammate before the audit, obviously, um, about who's covering what, that which will be documented in some sort of timetable. So we're clear on which activities or for, for my types of audits, which standards we're each covering. We might then meet up early prior to the audit on that morning and just go through everything to make sure that we understand how it's going to work. Now, if you're working as an audit team and as a team leader, it's really important, especially if it's a multiple day audit as well, to have regular catch ups to see where each other is at, um, because you might come across some common areas and you don't want to both be covering those particularly if it's um, a, a certification audit or you're covering multiple systems like um, OH&S environment and quality there could be some crossovers there particularly if a system's very well integrated so it's really really important to keep that communication up throughout the last thing we have to do as part of our preparation is our checklist of questions, which we can put together because we've conducted a document review. Now, it's not all the time in, or in all cases that we will prepare our own checklist of questions. A lot of organisations have like pre-prepared checklists um, that are based on the procedure, that are based on the standards. So it depends on how and, and which area you operate as an auditor. So if you're an internal auditor, the business that you conduct internal audits for um, might already have checklists for you to use, all right? If there are no checklists, and this is for me as a certification auditor, um, I don't have a pre-prepared checklist. It's up to me to take 
notes, okay? Write my questions down. I personally use the timetable as a bit of a checklist too. So, um, and I'm a bit old school. I normally have the timetable printed out so I can go, okay, done this, done that. Oh, no, that's changing. Got to move it to here. But it's, it's a real good checklist for me. Um, so I don't really write big questions I just write bullet points and then my, like a, it's sort of like a powerpoint essentially it's a prompt all right but this is really important checklists they're your own tool it doesn't matter how you do it, it, it they, they can be different it's your tool as long as how you manage these checklists um, of questions it produces the results you're after it keeps you on track. It supports you in asking your questions um, and keeping on digging and following up audit trails, okay? So as I said, I'm very, like I write a lot of notes, not on a notepad. I'm sort of sort of up with things. I have an electronic um, notebook that I use, but I've worked with auditors that they've pre-formatted their own checklist and they use a tablet, okay? It's completely your tool right sorry I'm scrolling back up so that was preparing on-site activities then we move to step four because now we are ready it's important to note that it's not just all about this is it conducting on-site activities it's not just about rocking up and asking questions either right we've got this preparation to do here and you know what part of this preparation and this might be an improvement opportunity for us as well part of this preparation is to understand well is the audit all on site there could be part of it that's remote which we need to allow for all right so it's not always just on site but in this example that's what we're going for obviously all right so you can see smack bang in the middle is where we actually start conducting the audit. So I've done all of this preparation beforehand. I've got my audit plan. I've got my timetable because I know who my audit team is. I've written my checklist of questions out. I've done my document review. So I sort of have an idea of what they say they do. I am ready to go. And that's your on-site activities. But it's not just about rocking up and asking those questions. There's some things we have to do beforehand and there's some other things afterwards as well. The first thing we need to do for step four, conducting on-site activities, is an opening meeting. All right. This is just all about confirming what's in the audit plan and the timetable. Okay. Has anything changed? You'll probably confirm the objective, scope and criteria as well. Um, you'll explain to them the methods of communication, confirm the steps in the timetable. And if there's anything's changed, you can mark up the timetable. That's why I always say don't get hung up on your timetable because it's going to change. And it also gives you an opportunity to ask the auditees if they have any questions as well like you may have missed something or something might be of you know importance to them that you hadn't picked up so it's it's that initial meet and greet and getting comfortable with each other all right so opening meeting what i personally do um, after the opening meeting is um then have a discussion about the previous audit finding. That's what this opening meeting is about. And while you are sort of following up previous findings, so that could be non-conformances, observations, improvement opportunities, I do all of them regardless. It does give them an opportunity to share what they've done since the last audit with regards to those findings. And while you might not be able to see the evidence while you're in there, it gives you an idea, again, start writing your questions down. It gives you an idea of 
where you do have to go, what you do have to ask to verify those corrective actions that they've told you about. All right. So it it helps you to remember what it was all about. It gives you an idea of what they've actually implemented. And then throughout the course of the audit, you know how and where to follow those up. Because obviously, something I always say, an audit is not a single event. It is something that you're always constantly following up um, those previous findings. And it's our role as auditors to close those out each time. And if we don't close them out, we might downgrade them if they've done some partial work or if they've done nothing we'll be upgrading them okay so it's really important to stay on top of um, those previous audit findings and I do that after the opening meeting so there's a there's a tip there um, again you need to organize ensure that they understand how things are going to be communicated. You do that in the opening meeting. Again, I have a I have my own little checklist um, that I use for my opening meetings and I have my little closing meeting checklist as well. Just of, you know, I don't know, there's probably six, seven, eight points on there that I know I need to cover um, for my clients and the industries and sectors that I ordered in. You can have your own list, obviously. Um, and part of that is explaining that, you know, you'll be verbally confirming any findings as you go. You will be taking notes. You'll be confirming any findings at the closing meeting and so on. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. At the opening meeting, again, this is where you would confirm um, any guides that you'll have during the course of the audit. Um, who's, who's going to be with you during that duration of the audit. Um, and if you've got any observers with you, well, it could be on both sides, I guess. So, But for me, normally, if it's a, um, I'm just trying to think. Oh, yeah. The, my next audit, I'm actually being observed because as a certification auditor, I can't remember how often it is. There's a moderation um, process that the um, certification body has to go through. So another auditor has to observe you conduct certain elements of the audit. So at that opening meeting, I'm just, they already know they're coming. Obviously we need, we need to get their approval, but you have to ensure that you introduce them and explain the role because an observer is not part of the audit. They will not be asking any questions. They're purely for me. Okay, the, like I'm being audited. So that's one example of when there's an observer. Um, sometimes there might be a new auditor um, and they're just sort of onboarding them and they might just be observing how you conduct the audit, but they're not a part of it, all right? So there's sort of different, different le levels there. Then, of course, during the audit, this is conducting your audit interviews. Okay, where you will be asking questions, collecting um, information, collecting evidence, collecting records, all taking you towards the outcome or the objective of the audit, which is to determine the extent of conformance against the criteria. Okay, that's, that's your whole goal for being there. All right. So, yep, definitely. We can have a chat. You can tell me how you do it, but we want to see how you do it, okay? And if you say you complete this form or this part of the process, can I see it? I need to see, or oh, has it been done, all right? So always be verifying. Um, and, of course, the output from that is generating your audit findings, okay? As you go along and collect your evidence, you'll be going, okay, well, that's conforming. And that's what we have to remember. Majority of the time, it is conforming. But we have to make sure it is and still have objective evidence. It's not, you know, all warm, fuzzy feeling stuff. We still need objective evidence. Um, and then, of course, if there are gaps, um, which could, depending on the grading, could be non-conformances, major or minor observations or improvement opportunities, 
I use those terms all the time because they're most common, but sometimes different organisations use different terms, all right? So it's really important for us as auditors to understand what those terms are. Is there any more? There is. Oh, preparing your audit conclusions. This is normally at a team meeting, all right? So we've had our opening meeting. We've gone around and asked some questions, collected the evidence. We've got some findings, so non potential non-conformances or observations. Then at our team meeting, we prepare our audit conclusions, okay? So this is all so that we can, can like present them at the closing meeting, right? That is purely the main aim of this team meeting is to line all of the ducks up, okay? Make sure we can back ourselves up. We shouldn't have gotten to this stage without having obtained agreement already from the auditee at least and ensure that we understood what they have shown us and explained why it was not conforming, right, and got them to go, oh, yeah, yeah, and agreed to that. Um, and then, so sorry, what I do here is I actually type these up in the team meeting. What I do is type up non-conformances, observations, improvement opportunities, like they will be receiving them in the report. So then when I'm at the closing meeting, I have my laptop with me and I go through these findings, okay, because it's a good test for me to see whether they understand um, what the report is saying, what the non-conformances and so on are, because once we leave, that's all they've got is that report. So I am constantly in a closing meeting. If they've asked a question or it's clear that they weren't quite sure, I'll highlight it or type some notes in there so I know when I go to finish the audit report that I've got to tidy that up a bit. So it's a really good opportunity to test how you've written up your non-conformances. So that's four, all right? Now... We go to step five. So we're nearly there. We've done it. Okay. So now we need to oh, prepare this audit report. Which sometimes you think, oh, I finished the audit. <laughs> now I've got to do the audit report. And I don't know about you guys, but some of my clients, I can do the audit report really quickly. But some, it's just, like never ending. I think the more complex it is and if it's a triple certified um, audit and company, it just seems to take so much longer. But for me, I need I need to do it pretty much straight away, okay, the next day. I Because there's while you've taken notes, there's still a lot of, I'm going to say, tacit knowledge in your head that you remember from conversations that uh, some context is probably a better word so you that that context is still you know live and kicking because you've just finished the audit if I if I was to leave it any longer I think I'd I just wouldn't remember those more intimate like contextual side of things from my written notes so now we need to prepare the audit report Okay, that's sort of, I oh know, Kelly's done it like this. I like, I like this step-by-step -step bit. Um, so we do have to do our audit report. But as I said, in the team meeting, I actually have, sh I should have already written up any findings. So that part of the report is, is pretty much done, except for a few things I need to tidy up. Um, so then, of course, you've got to complete the rest of the report. And it depends on the types of reports you write. write. If, you, if your audit reports are by exception, reporting by exception just means that um, you're reporting the findings only. But for um, management systems, and particularly for me as a certification auditor, I need to also report on what's satisfactory. We've got two to go, six. 
Completing the audit. So we say that you've completed the audit when everything in that timetable is, is done, all right? Don't forget, though, that as part of your audit, you may have, um, you may have collected um, records or evidence. It could be hard copy. It could be electronic. Um, so you really need to be conscious about returning that, ensuring that it is returned, um, or if you've taken it that it's shredded and confirming what you have actually done with that evidence. I always, um, if I collect evidence and it's hard copy at the closing meeting, which is in step four as your last on-site activity, at the closing meeting, I always make a big deal of having it all lined up. You know, if I'm in a, if we're in a meeting room or something, I line it all up, I keep it neat and tidy all in their separate bundles and say, okay, this is what I've returned, bang, 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 bang. All I've got is what I came in with, all right? Really ensure that they understand <clears throat> that, yeah, you're aware of um, that information security side of things. If in the event that um, you do need to take something with you, um, always ask permission. I'm not you know, so, sometimes if it's a copy of something and it's not necessary for them and you might want to refer to it to get a little bit more context in your audit report, that might be when you take something. But yeah, if, that, if that's the case, you might need more time um, allocated for the audit. That's something else to consider. Um, taking photos as well. Remember to always ask permission before you take photos. I personally don't like getting people in it and if 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 the person is part of it always ask their permission first all right so but if, this is just all about being sensitive about the information that you have collected all right so that's on that completion of the audit confidentiality comes into play with completion of the audit as well so you know what we've learnt and discovered and seen we don't talk about with our next client. And Tony and Kelly, you might have the same issue. Like it's a small world that we rotate in. And for me, my audit clients and even training um, clients, their customers or their suppliers are also mine. So we'll be reading something or talking to someone and they'll mention a different company and you'll go, oh, like I audit them or yeah, or you're reviewing their supplier list and you can see some of your clients and there might have been a, an issue or a complaint. <laughs> so it's it, we really have to be aware of confidentiality, all right? So that's six. And then the final one is seven. Yay, conduct our follow-up. Now, the follow-up, you know how I said before, an audit is not a single event. So when we've completed one audit, well, we're planning for the next one. So if there's major non-conformances, we will do a follow-up audit specifically for that major non-conformance, and that will be within 90 days. That's a normal time frame. Um, but your next audit, if there's minor non-conformances or observations only, will be at the next scheduled audit, which is normally 12 months. And that loops back to what we were saying in step four is at the opening meeting, you will go through the previous findings. So this loops back, well, actually this loops back to here, doesn't it? It's just this cyclical process all the way through. We'll just start from scratch again. All right. So as I said, to start this off with, I wanted to go through all of these because I'll get rid of that now so I don't have to go up and down because it is all of these things. All right. And when you can see it in a picture, you'll understand how one links to the next. And then, as I said, 
loops back to start all over again. That cyclical process because an audit is not a single event. Mm-hmm.